Welcome to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz, and we are joined by Luke Correa. He is a member of the California State Senate. He is the chair of the Senate Select Committee on California-Mexico Cooperation. And as a result, you recently took a trip to Mexico. That's correct. The border between California and Mexico and beyond. I've taken trips to the border, and I've also taken trips to Mexico City. Let's begin at the start, which Please. is an interesting committee. Um, California, very big economy in the world, eighth largest economy in the world, big trade with China, but our number one trading partner is Mexico. Really? And we do more trade with Mexico than with any other country in the world. So the concept is we want to create jobs, more business, more trade. How has NAFTA impacted our trade with Mexico? We can talk about Canada later. But, you know, NAFTA is still a bit controversial. How has NAFTA impacted that? Tremendous opening of trade with Mexico and Canada, especially with Mexico, though. But is it to our benefit or their benefit? It's a benefit to both because Mexico is California's number one purchaser right. of goods in the world. And what about the other way? Does Mexico take our goods as readily as easily. I guess they must. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Mexico buys more goods and services from California than any other country. But you believe there are more opportunities. Tremendous. And I just came back from the border. Right, exactly. And just to get across the border is a nightmare. And you've got lines of miles and miles of trucks coming into Mexico as well as going out of California to Mexico. And, and begs the question, there is no doubt that immigration is impacting trade when we look at the desire to increase our business cooperation with Mexico. Well, it's, it's called border security, but we have to have a smart border. And I'll give you an example. Why do we have people lined up, trucks lined up at the border when we could do what Texas is doing? Which, which is? Smart border inland ports, which is, why don't you inspect those trucks mm -hmm. a few miles away from the border, make sure they come through the border untouched and just pat wave them through. By the way, we also have the highway patrol at the border. So after the feds get done checking the trucks, then they go to the state of California but checkpoints. It, is it a state issue or a federal issue? It's both. Right. It's both. Which complicates it. Complicates it, but it is important for the safety of Californians. You have feds which are checking for drugs, which are checking for folks who may should, should not be entering, mm -hmm. yes. But you're also checking for agricultural issues. What could you bring in? What can you not? But I'm just wondering, we look at what's happening in Washington, D.C. with the desire for immigration reform or lack of desire. And there's no doubt that the Republican members of the Congress are most interested in border security, whatever that term may mean to them. And as a result, if I look at the tea leaves, it seems that it's going to be even more difficult to get across the border because we're going to see more border fences. I mean, they want to triple. I think it's triple the number of border patrol. And so how do you jive that desire to fortify the border with bringing in more trade? How does one well, jive, not and, you specifically? And, and you've hit the nail, the issue right, right on the head, which is let's be smart about those precious taxpayers' dollars mm -hmm. that we have. Do we want a, a, a fortress or do we want a smart border? One that says, let's bring in trade. And, and if, you know, the com Mexicans also complain about U.S. dollars going back into Mexico that are essentially money laundered. And they also complain about our weapons. We talk about the drugs coming in. So there are issues on both sides. But building a smarter fence means what's going now at the ports. Now you have smugglers coming in right. by sea. And as long as we consume drugs in this country, somebody's going to come up with a smarter mousetrap. You, you mentioned drugs, and I think it's fair to say, and I don't know if the media reports are hyperbolic, it's not clear to me, but the general view is that Mexico is becoming more and more lawless. And I know just anecdotally from my social circles that 10 years ago we were excited to go to vacation in Mexico. Now we flee, you know, there, there are general fears about Mexico and tourism is so critical for Mexico. And why is that important to us? Because we want their economy to thrive. Then there would be less pressure 
for Mexicans to try to come into this nation. So As Americans, we have to be smart about our, our policies. Right. Um, everything you said is correct. The, the lawlessness begins to be less now. Mm -hmm. You but, feel that? Yes. Okay. But 10 years ago, what was a big issue? Drugs coming through the Caribbean. Right. So what did we do? We stopped the drug trade through Florida and the Caribbean, and all we did was really push that trade inland through Mexico. So we stopped it along that line, and we created a destabilized country through central Mexico. Mm -hmm. Now things are starting to stabilize, but you're absolutely right. That is a challenge. And I say it's beginning to change because you still hear about those incidences in, in certain areas of Mexico. It's also, it's especially the border towns. I mean, that's what's so frightening. Tijuana seems to be safer now than and it was. And you were specifically in Tijuana. But Juarez yes. continues to be challenged. Juarez is closer to, it's on the te Texas, Texas, right. Texas area. Well, tell me about your meeting with, I think you met with the mayor of Tijuana. Met with the mayor of Tijuana. Yeah, tell me he about says, that. let's do more trade. Let's do more cooperation. He wants more security. Co when he says security, let me give you an example. Yeah. So you have deportations of, of what we believe are just, you know, Mexican nationals going back right. across the border. What we do right now is we open the border. We didn't tell the Mexicans, was this guy deported because he was stopped on a traffic ticket? Mm -hmm. Is he a, a rapist? Right. Is he a murderer? Or, right. And I think we need to have more cooperation with the Mexicans because the, the, the Tijuana mayor now says 20, 30% of my homicides are because of these folks that you're dropping off at the border. Wow. So can we get together, folks? Is it literally that way, where if someone... That is what it is. I mean, in the United States, if you're an undocumented individual and you commit a crime, you do serve your time, and then you're deported. So literally, we just drive them down to San Diego and push? Push, many of them. And I've, I've, I've brought that issue up with the feds, and they say we're taking care of it. So yeah. is it the ICE that pushes? I mean, if you're right. in state this prison. This is a federal issue. So if you're in state prison, your sentence is con has concluded. But you're a federal prisoner. Because remember, you, you, you do that crime, you do that time, then, then you, you turn over to the over federal to authorities or the federal deploys. authorities, then, then you're dropped off. And I'm saying the following, which is the Mexicans have the same interests protecting their citizens that we have protecting ours here, which is you have somebody who's, who's not a good person, mm -hmm. when they get on the other side, you want to make sure that they address that person and not let them wander into the general I, population. I, do want, I want to ask you about immigration reform generally. You represent yeah. some beautiful portions of southern Los Angeles County and northern Orange County with some... Central Orange County, that's more correct. More central, yeah, and with some really rich, uh, diverse communities. Uh, many of those individuals are undocumented. What are their hopes and fears and dreams about immigration reform? Well, as you know, that's a big challenge, which is a lot of them want the American dream, which is mm -hmm. have the opportunity to, to be right. legal residents, hopefully someday citizens, earn their citizenship. They want to pay their taxes, learn English, uh, and, and do those things that all of us do, which is work hard, pay taxes, possibly buy a house, send their kids to college and be productive but members of society. As we look at what's happening in Washington, as we speak today, immigration reform seems stalled. It does, it's not seeming, it is stalled. <laughs> it is stalled. And I don't think things will change in Washington for a very long time. Really? And that's why you see the states individually taking matters into their own hands. You hear about Alabama, but you hear also about California. Ultimately, what in California, what we've done is we recognize the value of these immigrants mm -hmm. to our workforce. Especially agriculture. Agriculture and many other sectors. Remember also, our, our immigration laws are so flawed. Mm -hmm. We bring in the best and brightest students from China, from India, other parts of the world. We give them a PhD in chemistry, engineering. We give them post-doctorate work and we say, we can't keep you because immigration. You'll come back? and com compete against us. You'll come back. His name is Luke Correa. My name is Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on Charter California Edition. What product qualifies as California's largest export? Computers and electronics, food, machinery, transportation equipment. The P 
Computers and electronic products are California's top export, accounting for 28% of all the state's exports. Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by Robin Itkin. She's an attorney with Steptoe & Johnson, an international law firm. She specializes in bankruptcy law. As you know, I used to be a lawyer and I went to law school in Washington, D.C. and Steptoe is based in Washington, D.C. So I know the firm well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So for better or for worse, we need to have you on the program <laughs> because we've seen a wave of municipal bankruptcies. I want to start with California, if we may, and then I want to move on to what's <coughs> happening in Michigan. Again. Okay. In California, the bankruptcies are? Well, we've had several. Right. We've had several, starting with uh, uh, Orange County in yes. 91. Oh, yes. And then going to Vallejo in 2008. Oh, yes. And we have Stockton and the big San Bernardino right. in 2012. And we have a couple smaller ones right. in between. And I think that it was the San Bernardino and Stockton bankruptcies that really caused shockwaves yes. to just flutter through not only California, but the entire nation. From your eyes, as a bankruptcy lawyer, as a restructuring attorney, what happened? Well, what happened is not so unusual mm. as to what's happening in every city and in a lot of different states, right. and that is the staggering unfunded pensions, the loss of tax revenues. You know, when property taxes go down because of property values, they're not collected as the high amount. Right. State sales taxes when people can't afford to buy a lot of things. So you've got increasing obligations um, and increasing and decreasing revenue. But I want to talk about the pension obligations. Yeah. And when I say pension, I also include retiree health care as well. Right. There's no doubt that in 2000, the bargaining partners on the public employee side did quite well in terms of increasing their benefit packages. That being said, there is an argument that if you work for a public entity, you may make less more money. You may make less money than your private counterparts, and the 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 flip side of that is you're able to get benefits that are superior to your private counterparts. What's your sense of that? Well, I think that's always been the argument, but I think what's happened now a lot is that you have the city employees making more money than you do private employees. We in have the heard private that sectors, and, and that's the big rub. I mean. The difficulty is to take away anything from somebody once they've planned on it. I mean, you, you work knowing that you're going to get these pensions, believing you're going to get these pensions, and it's very difficult when these problems occur and they have to be cut. But now, I have to ask you this. We know that if a municipality wants to change its pension formula, they can do so for new employees on a go-forward basis. Yes. The question is, can they do so for existing employees on a go-forward basis? For existing employees, yes, you can. Well, you can do it through a bankruptcy, and that's well, why people are okay, going to bankruptcy. Exactly. And and because also, no one wants to give in in informal discussions. No one wants to set a precedent. Right. So, unfortunately, or or fortunately, a bankruptcy brings everybody in one venue to negotiate these things. But what happens to these individuals who've been working for San Bernardino for forty years? And all of a sudden, their pension, I mean, it's like Enron Part right, 2. Right, absolutely. But you would never absolutely. expect a city never. to You're suffer. Never, no, but San Bernardino, San Bernardino owes over a billion dollars. That's their debt. And they can't pay it. They couldn't pay payroll. That's where they had to file. And it's going to affect the wealth and, and, and the welfare of, of all their citizens. And, so you have to take some cuts. And so pension obligations are dischargeable in bankruptcy. Well, they're not dischargeable that you can, you can cut them and you can change them and then you pay them out over time and it's a different mechanism. I mean Vallejo still has I think about 135 million it came out of bankruptcy with uh, these obligations. If you look at Stockton, Vallejo, San Bernardino when they file their list of creditors, the top ones are pensions and right. retirements. So over 100 million dollars. So yeah. they have to cut them and then and then and then they pay the what's there over time. And then there's Detroit. Yes, Detroit. I think it's the seventh largest city in the country. It was at one time a crown jewel in our nation. When you think about the music industry, the automobile industry, yes. it grew out of Detroit. I understand the Detroit suburbs are still thriving, but yet the city of Detroit is a shell of its former self. What can you tell us about that city and its municipal bankruptcy? Well, what I understand is that city had just, I mean, there's so many housing uh, developments that are empty. Uh, they had problems because they couldn't afford, they had an unbalanced budget. They couldn't pay. They would have, when police would go out, it would take over 50 minutes to respond to a call. 
the average in the nation's around 11. Right. I mean, it's a terrible thing, but the problem with that is, is they had three and a half billion in unfunded pensions as included in their little short of 20 billion in their debt, but Los Angeles mm. exceeds those amounts. Okay, eightfold. well, let's talk about Los Angeles because we know that as other cities in the state have started to see their budgets be in the black, not so for Los Angeles, still struggling. As you know, recently there was an agreement between Los Angeles and its largest public union partner, the DWP union. What's your sense of what's happening in LA? It's tough, it's very mm -hmm. tough. I mean, the pension obligations, the unfunded pension obligations in Los Angeles are about $25 billion and above. That's more than the entire debt that Detroit has uh, in its bankruptcy. Um, it's comprised of uh, fire and, and police right. pensions, the, the, the water and power employees. Right. Well, one could argue that that mayoral race was decided because the DW, DWP union supported the losing candidate. Right. Is well, that that's fair? what was said. That what was said. I don't know right. if that's really accurate. Right. Uh, but but both of the mayoral candidates talked about how bad things were in the city. How you have to we have to do something with these pensions, and you have fire trucks that have old navigation right. systems that need to be updated. So our health and welf welfare is being affected as well. So during the recent downturn in the entire state of California, we actually heard a rumblings maybe California should declare bankruptcy, the entire state of California. Well, it can't. Go. Because it's not, it's not Go. a municipality. Okay. <laughs> Go. The, the complexity is under Chapter 9 of the Bankruptcy right. Code, you have to be a municipality. A mu municipality is a city, a, right. a, a county, um, and it's not, it's a township, it's right. not a state. So the state can't. Every city in the state could potentially, but... California allows bankruptcies to be filed right. if there's a mediation that takes place first. It's really to be the last resort, the bankruptcy. There's a 60 to 90 day mediation that's, that's confidential or you're facing an immediate fiscal crisis. So I have to ask you, do you believe that we will see more municipal bankruptcies in California, part one, part two, in the nation? In my humble opinion, I do think there will be more because I really? think that people, the whole point is to try to negotiate, and that's what Chapter 9 and, and the state law requires, to negotiate first before you would have to file as a last resort. But people aren't giving because they're not in that form that's forcing them Even to take a cut. Even though the economy is turning around? Well, you would think that, but that's people don't like to set precedents. The unions don't like to set precedents by giving in. Um, but people have to think about when these bankruptcies are so expensive, Vallejo, the fees were over $13 million. Who makes um, that money? Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> I the lawyers. Do, I, want, but, uh, I want to ask you one other thing. It may be outside of your belly work, but I have a sense that you'll be able to answer this. You may have heard, and I'm sure you know about the mortgage crises throughout the state of California. And certain cities, including San Bernardino County, had looked at having municipal governments take the mortgages right. by eminent domain. Right. Richmond in Contra Costa County is looking to do that. I mean, there's so many issues. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, 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 there's yeah. so many issues with that because, and also Obama's trying to pass these laws right. and help people keep their houses exactly. and not have foreclosures when they're bankruptcy in Chapter 13. Right, they can't do it. So it, it's a mess. But that's a huge problem because it would be good citizens who pay their mortgages right. but needed to work something out. We're told they could not work it out right. unless they defaulted. So you were forced. That happens all the time. It happens all the time. So people are forced to default are and they lose are it. Are mortgages dischargeable in bankruptcy? Not they're secured. Mortgages no. are secured by of the course. property, so you can't discharge them. But is there a homestead exemption? There's I'm, homestead I'm, exemption. I'm marketing back to my yes, law school days. Certain states have homestead California. exemptions. California, yes, and but that's you just get to keep 100,000, 150 or something if your house is worth, you know, 500,000. 500, yeah. So I mean, it's not a whole lot for somebody because you'll lose your house. But there are laws and there are negotiations taking place now to try to change this because people are losing their homes left and right. And when a renegotiation could take place. It is absolutely complex and complicated, but fortunately, Robert, Robin Itkin can <laughs> march her way through it. She's a lawyer at Steptoe & Johnson. My name is Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back with Gary DeLong, who's a member of the Long Beach City Council. Thank you. How many municipal bankruptcy filings have been made since January 2010?
Since January 2010, 36 municipalities have been filed for bankruptcy protection. Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Gary DeLong, he is a member of the City Council in Long Beach. And we just spoke with Robin Itkin, who is discussing municipal bankruptcies. We know that in California, we saw Stockton, we saw San Bernardino. We just mentioned Detroit with Robin. I'm not suggesting Long Beach is on the verge of municipal bankruptcy. That's not even suggestible. No. But do talk to us about the health of cities and how cities have managed over this recent great recession. You bet. Well, first of all, let me just say that in my opinion, I think there's many municipal bankruptcies still to come. So you there's a far more in the future than mm -hmm. there have been in the past. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, in Long Beach, we've done a pretty good job managing our finances. So we're not one of those cities that's on the brink. Yet we have our challenges. You know, we have tremendous unfunded liabilities. We have almost $800 million in unfunded pension liabilities. We have hundreds of millions of dollars of other unfunded liabilities. So and it's a challenge. Let's do talk about pensions because many folks point to pension obligations as the reason for municipal pain. Many reasons, but that's probably the top reason, so not the only one. What is the answer to this pension quandary? Because well, in the final analysis, many people choose to go to the public sector because they perceive that they will be taken care of you know, in their later years, whereas in the private sector, not as much. And if we start pulling that benefit, you know, query whether we can attract public sector workers. Well, but what happened was, as many years ago, in order to get that long-term benefit, that security, they, they, in exchange for it, they had lower wages. Right. And what's happened is today, the public sector have comparable or even better wages in the private sector. Truly? Plus, I mean, truly, truly. Well, it is in the city of Long Beach where I'm very okay. familiar, and I think Fair it's enough. other cities as well. And they have a very rich pension formula. And then also what happened, as you no doubt recall, is back in 2000, where we had like 50% pension increases. Right. And that's really what, what skewed the system. We went from a sustainable system to an unsustainable system. And candidly, until the state legislature acts, and it might be through a court process, a legal right. process, but until they act and say, you can reduce pension benefits on a going forward basis. On a go no, that going we can forward. do. No, you can't today. No, but well, with new hires. You can with new hires, but right. with already, 90 some percent of your workforce is right. existing employees. And when you talk about unfunded liabilities, it's for the existing employees. Well, we know that I believe San Diego and one other city looked. San Jose. San Jose passed pension reform. They did. Which includes altering pension benefits for existing employees. Yes. Which some have argued is unconstitutional. Whether a court will agree with that is to be determined, correct? Exactly. And it's unconstitutional because you go back to 1948 where there were cities that tried to take away pension benefits that had already been earned. Right. But you can't do that. You can't take something away from somebody. So you think there's an argument forward. that we can't touch the earned Absolutely pension benefits. Not. But starting today, yes, we can change the we can pay, change the pension formula. And you need obviously negotiate that right. through, through you know meet and confer with the unions and so forth. So it is a it's a collaborative process. We know that recently Los Angeles had some fits and starts with its largest union through the Department of Water and Power. Yes. Ultimately, there was a resolution. Talk to us about that process as it relates to Long Beach, as an example of a major city in our state where you're negotiating with unions that. You know, like you said, in 2000, really did quite well, and now they're having to go to their membership and say, you know, we, we're not on the gravy train anymore. Well, Kenley, in my view, the process is broken. Like, mm -hmm. for example, we'll make an offer to, to the union, then make a counter offer, we'll make another offer, and it's all done in, behind closed doors. It's all done in secret. The public mm -hmm. has no access to what are we Why? negotiating until at the last minute say that, that I've made an offer, you've accepted it, then I'm gonna put it on a public calendar for ratification. And let's say you come, a member of the public comes and says, this is a terrible deal you people have negotiated. We basically have to go through with it because otherwise the, the city attorney is gonna say, well, you can't change your offer. You know, you can't renege on a so commitment what's the you've answer? made. What well, I think, I think the answer is we need to publicize the information. Hmm. When we make an offer, it should be public for but two days, three then, days, a week. Could we then see negotiations being meted out in public and that would only jeopardize and complicate the process? I think it will complicate the process, but I think the, the right for the public to know what's going on is a higher priority for me than, yes, it will make it more complicated. Why is it in your mind, though, that some cities, Long Beach, for example, mm -hmm. has had outstanding relations with its uh, public employee partnerships, its partners in the public union sector, and yet other cities have just fallen down and not been able to make it work. 
Well, I think it's a matter of being combative versus collaborative. I mean, candidly, you could almost accuse Long Beach of being overly collaborative. You know, we've had maybe too much of a partnership in some areas when it comes to our, our labor negotiations. You go through this contract, there's a lot of giveaways that are in there. But mm -hmm. having said that, we still need to work together. At the end of the day, we all want the same thing. I want to talk to you about the economy generally, because you're going through the budget process now. Yeah. And as I understand it, Long Beach's budget looks pretty good. First time in years. Yeah, probably a small surplus, some concerns in the later years. But it begs the question about whether we really are seeing our economy turn around. If you look at unemployment figures uh, in California, we do see a downward trend. It's undeniable. Uh, in L.A. County, we also see a downward trend, but we're still stubbornly close to 10 percent unemployment. Yes, and in Long Beach, it's even actually a little higher than that. So there's certainly we've made improvements. Property taxes are rising, other revenue sources. But candidly, we're not out of the woods. I mean, the reason we have a surplus this year is because of, of redevelopment agencies going away. Uh, 11 million of those dollars came back to the general fund. So we look better oh, in the short term, but it cost us $100 million in investment in our community to get these short term dollars. So short term we look good, but long term not as well. You mentioned property taxes. We also know for better or for worse that the housing market is surging. It is. Especially in Los Angeles County where you see prices up in June, they were up almost 31% year to date. On the one hand, hallelujah. On the other hand, are we going through more exuberance that's gonna cause another collapse? Well, that's right. I mean, anytime you have a bubble, it's gonna get popped. Is it a part. bubble? Well, if you have a 31% growth, right. th th there's no external factors that would support that. So clearly that appears to be some type of bubble. And if you have kids, like I have two daughters that recently right. graduated from college, so how are they gonna build a four to house seven, eight, 10 years from now if you have those large double digit annual increases? What about in South LA County, in the Long Beach area? Mm -hmm. Is there that exuberance going on and there, seeing prices rise too quickly? Somewhat, but hopefully they're gonna stabilize over time, right? I mean, from both a consumer as well as a real estate in industry, what you wanna see is a modest growth rate year after year. That's what's best for everybody. I wanna get your take on something. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but you're a bright guy, you'll, you'll work with me. You may have heard that there were some municipalities, especially in areas very hard hit, by the downturn of using eminent domain mm -hmm. to take over mortgages. There is now one municipality in Contra Costa County, Richmond, that is moving forward with that plan. If you don't know about the plan, it's fine, but I wanna get a sense from you about how active a government should be in trying to protect homeowners. I, well, first of all, let me just say, in general, I would be opposed to eminent domain, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, that's taking something away from somebody that doesn't want to give it up. So I'm generally opposed to that. However, you know, certainly there are occasions where it makes sense to do that. But I don't know that I know enough about this plan to comment on, but I would say I don't want government to be overly involved in the mortgage market because that's what got us into this mess. And you, know, you look at Fannie Mae. And, and the things that they did to prop up housing, to, to support no, no down loans, uh, you know, you don't have to prove your credit worthiness. That's what caused this bubble and that's what caused the crash. Well, if that's I, one of the causes, I there, hear there are other things as well. If I may, I wanna talk about the Long Beach mayor's race. Yes. I know no endorsements have been made by Gary DeLong and I'm not Thank asking you. you to make one on television A right number now. of great candidates. No doubt, <laughs> but do talk to us. I mean, it really, a bit of a surprise that the incumbent mayor, Bob Foster, is not running for reelection. Not to me. Yeah, not, not to you, but you know more <laughs> than I do. Um, talk to us about the race generally. Again, I'm not asking about candidates, but just the fact that we are turning a page. I mean, we've had two, Beverly O'Neill, a very well-liked, strong, yes. effective mayor, Bob Foster, also well-liked. I mean, th th this is a big, big deal. This yeah, is a big change. And, and both Bob, Beverly and Bob have done tremendous jobs for the city of Long Beach. We owe them a great a debt right. of gratitude, but in different ways, right? right? I mean, they are very, very different Very people. different. So when you look at the current crop of candidates, I don't see a Bob Foster in there, Right. but I think there's somebody that's gonna rise to the top. Three of your colleagues on the city council I, currently announced. Yes, yes indeed. Uh, and who knows who else could jump in? Not me. Not you. <laughs> I keep saying but Gary DeLong you. should look at the mayor's <laughs> race, I but I think that. he's passed. Thank you. Okay, we've been speaking with Gary DeLong. He is a member of the Long Beach City Council. My name is Brad Palmer. So I want to thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition.